Hi, everybody. Welcome to session 152, Monitoring of Low and Intermediate Risk Papillary and Follicular Thyroid Cancer Patients in the First Five Years After Initial Treatments. My name is Daria Gerald, and I'm a thyroid cancer survivor, and my role today is just to help facilitate. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sana Ghaznavi. Dr. Ghaznavi is an endocrinologist and neuroendocrine tumor team lead at Tom Baker Cancer Center, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Her research interests include active surveillance of papillary microcarcinomas, resensitization therapy of uh, or for radioiodine refractory thyroid cancer and personalization of thyroid hormone replacement therapy. Her practice focuses on the management of thyroid cancer patients. We will be taking questions at the end. So I'll turn it over to the doctor. Thank you. Awesome. So as um, introduced, my name is Sana Ghaznavi. I'm an endocrinologist from Canada. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about monitoring in the first five years after your initial treatment, which would be either a partial or complete um, resection of your thyroid. And so actually, before I get started, I just want to say thank you so much to Gary and Thyka for having me here. Out of all of the different academic things that we get to do, I think being here with patients, and actually hearing directly about your patient journeys and different experiences and the questions asked, um, it's really, really helpful. It actually makes, I think, me a better doctor. Um, and it's one of the most fun things that I get to do. And this is, I think, my second or third year doing it. So I'm, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Thank you. Aha. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Jackson. Okay, so outline what I'm going to talk about is define what low and intermediate risk patients actually means. I'm going to talk about disease monitoring, which basically is how do we watch you to see if the thyroid cancer is gone or if it's come back. Uh, the next part is I'm going to talk about a risk stratified approach to monitoring because in the modern era of thyroid cancer management, this is how we uh, decide how to monitor patients. It's not the same for everyone. And then we're going to have lots of time for discussion and questions. So to talk about low and intermediate risk patients, when a patient is diagnosed with thyroid cancer, and specifically today I'm talking about papillary and follicular thyroid cancer. So the people or groups that I'm excluding are medullary thyroid cancer patients and anaplastic thyroid cancer patients. So basically, if you're not medullary or anaplastic or anyone else, um, it falls under this this kind of umbrella term of called differentiated thyroid cancer, DTC. Okay. So you had for whatever reason, um, an ultrasound done that found a nodule, had a biopsy. It came back as most commonly papillary, but sometimes other types of thyroid cancer had your initial thyroid surgery. And now we're going to risk stratify that patient. And what risk stratification really means is I'm going to figure out what your stage is. And staging has to do with what is the risk of dying from thyroid cancer? And how I explain it to my patients is what's the chances that this is going to change your life expectancy in any way? And the vast majority of thyroid cancer patients actually fall into stage one thyroid cancer, which has a long-term survival of 98 to 100%. So for most patients, the answer to this question will actually be, it won't be impacting my life expectancy in any way, okay? The other way that we risk stratify patients is to stratify them based on their risk of recurrence. So will the, what's the likelihood that the cancer is going to be growing back? And that is classified currently under the American Thyroid Association or ATA risk classification system. And we use three buckets, three categories. They're called low, intermediate, and high risk of recurrence. So I think that is really nice because it has just inherent face understanding. Like just you hear the term low risk or high risk, and it, it sort of inherently makes sense um, what your risk of recurrence is. So uh, once we risk stratify a patient into their stage and their risk of recurrence, um, or sorry, at the beginning, when we first see a patient postoperatively, that's what we're going to do. We're going to risk stratify them into their stage and risk of recurrence. So how does your medical team determine the risk of recurrence? We're going to integrate a number of different variables. Some of them happen before the surgery. And Dr. Amadi here, that's sitting at the front here, just gave a really good talk about preoperative imaging and preoperative evaluation of patients. And so basically preoperatively is all the stuff that happened before the surgery to figure out what was the extent of thyroid cancer. Did you have just a nodule? Were there lymph nodes involved? Was the tumor actually poking out of the thyroid and stuck to something like an airway or like a nerve? So it's all of the preoperative information we got. For most patients, that will be 
a neck ultrasound. And I specifically say neck ultrasound and not thyroid ultrasound because you do need to evaluate more than just the thyroid. Basically, what are the components that we're going to use, all the different medical information we're going to use to risk stratify you, so to assign a stage and a risk of recurrence. And so preoperatively, as I said, neck ultrasound is super important. And, and why I specified neck is because if it's just the thyroid, you can definitely miss lymph nodes that are in the, the outside, the lateral compartment um, or in the central compartment. So around the thyroids, you do need a good high quality neck ultrasound. I think that can't be overstated. Um, and then surgeons will assess your vocal cords um, at baseline. That's pretty much standard practice at this point. So uh, just to make sure that the vocal cords are moving correctly and that sort of thing, um, it's not always going to happen for really small tumors, uh, for sure not, but most places they, they will assess your vocal cords pre-op. So then you go, you, you consent to the surgery, you go for surgery in the surgery itself. So intraoperatively, there's a number of different things that the surgeon is going to be looking for. And then in at centers, um, because this is a multidisciplinary disease, which means that you don't have just one doctor treat this, you need a number of different doctors of different specialties. Super important that your surgeons are talking to the endocrinologists because we're the ones that are going to have to interpret all the stuff that happened in the surgery and figure out what we're gonna do about it afterwards with the patient, okay? So operative report, uh, essentially the things that I'm looking for in the operative report from the surgeon is, um, did the surgeon think the thyroid cancer was poking out of the thyroid? The medical term for this is extra thyroidal extension. And was it stuck to stuff? So if it was stuck to stuff, what was it stuck to? And did you shave it off? Did you have to take out that section that was, so if, pretend that it was stuck to a, um, a muscle and they actually took out that part of the muscle. So essentially I want to know, was it poking out? Was it stuck to anything? And if it was, what'd you do about it? Okay. And that helps me understand, was the surgeon able to remove the entire tumor? That's called complete resection. And it's super, super important for us to know if you've had a complete resection, if everything has been taken out at the time of surgery. So we're using that information. And then post-operatively, um, the patient and I, usually the first time that endocrinologists meet their patient is actually after the surgery has happened. It's about six to eight weeks post-op. And what I typically do is spend a lot of time going through in detail the pathology report. So it's basically your thyroid was taken out, it was chopped up and it put on, on slides and a pathologist looked at it and said what whatever they saw under the microscope. And so one of the things I'm looking for is how big the tumor was, what was the type? So was it papillary or follicular some other type and also subtyping is important. So there are certain aggressive variants of papillary, for example, like tall cell variant papillary thyroid cancer. So I wanna know about the subtype and then lymph node status. So how many lymph nodes came out, how big were they and what area were they in? Because obviously if all of them were in one side, say the right side, that's the side I'm really gonna be watching for recurrence, right? Um, the next thing that we use is post-operative thyroglobulin. So that's a blood test that you guys would have had at six to eight years. At some centers, it's four weeks post-op, some centers six or eight. So it's variable, but basically at some point in the first one to two months after the surgery, we'll do this blood test and it establishes a baseline. So it doesn't have to be zero. Um, it depends on the extent of surgery and the surgeon and how much normal tissue they leave behind called a remnant. But I want to know, is it low and reassuring? that there's no big stuff left in your body that's thyroid cancer or is it really high and I've got to go looking before we treat you with radioactive iodine and then the last piece that we would use uh, to risk stratify a patient is their post radioactive iodine scan so then you say you had your surgery you have you are given radioactive iodine a anywhere from five to 10 days later, depending on your center, they do a whole body scan head to toe. And then that's gonna light up wherever there's leftover thyroid cells. And that information is used to complete your staging. So say I saw uh, uptake brightness in the lungs that I would have, then that implies that there was thyroid cancer in the lungs. That's why it took up the radioactive iodine. So that helps with our staging. So essentially your medical team is integrating all of the things I just said, your preoperative neck ultrasound, uh, the operative findings, what did the surgeon think was happening in the surgery and then post-operative. So you can see that first of all, this disease really requires the co cooperation and collaboration of a number of different people and specialists. And the better that your specialists are at their center communicating with one another, the better the care for the patient, right? So I think that's really important um, uh, thing to note. 
So estimating the risk of occurrence, so we got all that information now and we're gonna put it together and figure out if the patient is high risk. This is a talk about low and intermediate risk. So I'm gonna focus on that part. So I'll skip that just for time. Intermediate risk is basically patients who have an aggressive subtype. So I had mentioned something called tall cell variant, but there's numerous, probably 10 other ones, insular, solid variant, hobnail, a whole bunch of different ones. And you would basically just have to look at your pathology report to say what type of, or subtype Type of um, thyroid cancer did you have? The next part is a papillary thyroid cancer that's spread into blood vessels. That's called vascular invasion on a um, pathology report. And then the final is lots of small to medium lymph nodes. And what lots is defined as uh, is greater than five. So if you had six lymph nodes and they were one centimeter, um, the biggest one was one centimeter, it would classify you, your risk stratify you as intermediate risk. Okay. And then low risk is our patients where the tumor was entirely inside the thyroid. So it hadn't poked out, it hadn't stuck itself to anything. There was no lymph nodes involved. It's just in the thyroid. Surgeon took the thyroid out. Everything's come out with it. Theoretically, in that case, the chances of cure are very, very high, right? And so that's a low risk of recurrence patient. Now, low risk is not no risk. Um, and that's why we still monitor patients that are low risk. And we still make sure that their thyroid cancer is gone. Um, low risk is defined as about 5% or less risk of recurrence during follow-up, okay? So this is a really famous figure that every physician that's ever done thyroid cancer, it's memorized. And this is on page 42 of the 2015 ATA guidelines. I'm sad that I know this information, um, but it's, it's a very famous risk figure. And the point, the reason I put up here not, is not to make you experts at all the risk stratification, but it's essentially to say, this is a spectrum of disease. So it's not like, you know, you're, we have to place people into buckets, but it doesn't go from like zero percent to five to 30 to 50 it's sort of a spectrum where the more stuff you have that increases your risk the higher your risk kind of becomes overall um, so prognosis is based on initial risk stratification at first, because obviously at first, that's all we have. So your initial ATA risk, if you're low risk, the risk of recurrence is somewhere between three to 5%. And if you're classified as intermediate risk, then the risk of recurrence is 15 to 40%. This is based on data where for the majority of uh, studies involved, the follow-up was 10 years or less. So it's not based on 20, 30, 40 year data why that's relevant is because I have a ton of patients in my practice that are 21 years old. And so do they necessarily care what their risk of recurrence at by 26 is? No, they want to know, is this going to become a problem for me at any point in my life? And we actually don't have literature to help us answer that question. Okay, so group risk versus individual risk. This is something that um, Dr. Amati and I uh, share a mentor, Dr. Mike Tuttle uh, at MSK, and he taught me this and I thought it was really relevant and important. I've started thinking differently about how I communicate this. So what I mean by this is um, here in this image on the left-hand side of the screen, um, there's a 5% chance. So the person who's affected has is in red, okay? Everybody else who's else who's unaffected is in green. And what it's depicting is a 5% risk, right? One out of 20. Now there's five out of 20 people affected. So there's a 20% risk. But when you're an individual, you are either affected or you're unaffected. So to say to you that you have a 20% chance, you have a zero or a hundred percent chance that you're going to get this problem, right? And so I think that that's really important to note is that when you're looking at group statistics, it does not necessarily mean that you're going to be that 5% or that 20% or that whatever percent. Every single person has to be sort of seen as an individual and their specific um, features of their thyroid cancer and their follow-up and all the information we have have to be taken into account. So um, it's, it's encouraging in a, in a way, because I think if you're looking at statistics and you think, well, I'm going to fall into this, it's not supposed to be applied to individuals. Okay. Um, practical tips. So I put a couple of practical tips because again, I'm giving a talk for, for patients. So make sure your medical team has access to both your surgery report, which is also known as an operative report and your pathology report, which is what the pathologist saw under the microscope, especially if you are going to a different center, um, than where you initially had your surgery. So say you had your surgery, but now you've transferred your care somewhere else. I, they do need that information because of all the things that I just said, where we integrate all those features. 
and then ask your doctor. So you've met your endocrinologist and they're treating you. So ask them what your stage and your ATA risk of recurrence are. They're probably using that paradigm, whether they've told you they are or not. It's pretty prevalent, meaning like most people in this field are using that. So ask them what it is so you can start to understand and place yourself with amongst any of the literature that you're reading or anything like that. And then do note that I'm presenting what's called the AJCC TNM staging system and the ATA risk of recurrence system. That's because we're in North America and that's the most prevalent system by far. But it doesn't mean that if your doctor is using a different validated system somewhere else in the wor world that they're doing it wrong. They're not doing it wrong. They're just doing it differently than we do it here. Okay. So part two, part two is disease monitoring. So I'm going to give a case. So this is a 28 year old woman um, seen in my practice, felt a lump in her right neck, which led to a neck ultrasound revealing a suspicious three centimeter thyroid nodule and an enlarged right neck lymph node. So she underwent biopsy of the right thyroid nodule and the right sided lymph node, and both were consistent with papillary thyroid cancer. So her PCP called her and told her that, and then uh, referred her on to us. Um, she went for surgery and that surgery included a total thyroidectomy and then a right lateral neck dissection. Um, and that's because they had found the lymph node because a good high quality neck ultrasound had been done preoperatively. Okay. Um, what came out was a right three centimeter classic papillary thyroid cancer in the right neck. There were 20 lymph nodes removed and eight of them were involved with cancer and the largest was two centimeters. And then post-operatively her thyroglobulin was pretty good, pretty low, 0 0.2 nanograms per milliliter um, on our assay. That number will also depend on where you are in the world, what center and what the assay is that they're using. So if I translate all the details that I just told you into her initial risk, she's a stage one risk of recurrence patient and intermediate risk, or sorry, stage one patient and intermediate risk of recurrence due to the size and the number of lymph nodes involved. So her initial treatment um, after the total thyroidectomy was radioactive iodine. And I gave her 30 millicuries of radioactive iodine, which is considered low dose radioactive iodine. And then the post-treatment scan showed no evidence of distant spread. Her, her TSH was within the target range where I wanted it. So the ATA guidelines stratify your TSH target range. Um, because this is an intermediate risk patient, her TSH target range is 0 0.1 to 0 0.5. And so I had her Synthroid titrated to get in that range. Okay, so um, that's just a summary of what we just said. Okay. Um, okay. So disease monitoring. So after your initial surgery, you'll be monitored with blood tests and imaging. Um, and so let's go over those. So blood work for papillary or follicular thyroid cancer. We talked a little bit about the fibroglobulin test. So that is a protein that thyroid cells are making. Thyroid cells, whether they're benign thyroid cells, normal thyroid cells from your thyroid that came out, or their thyroid cancer cells or their thyroid cancer in a lymph node or their thyroid cancer anywhere else. Basically, if there are thyroid cells in your body, you will make thyroglobulin and we detect it in the blood. Okay. Um, and then elevations. So say your tumor marker at first was only 0 0.2, but in the future it was five and then it was 20 and then it was hundred elevations of the, of the thyroglobulin. And as it keeps going up, that's our trigger that tells us that a recurrence might be happening. Um, thyroglobulin antibodies are a talk in and of themselves, to be honest. And so all I want to say about that is that if they're very high, then we can't actually rely on your tumor markers. So there are a good handful of patients in my practice where I can't really use their, their tumor marker, their thyroglobulin, because their antibodies are just too high. Okay. Can I just X this driver? Okay. Yep. Excellent. Okay, and then um, TSH obviously is used to ensure that you're on the correct dose of Synthroid. And also for patients that are intermediate or high risk, we actually try to keep their TSH purposely a little low um, in a specific target range, depending on whether you're intermediate or high risk. And that's because TSH is a hormone your body makes that's called thyroid stimulating hormone. And when you have thyroid cancer cells, we don't wanna stimulate them to grow. So that's why we're suppressing that hormone in your body. And you do that by selecting purposely a bit of a higher dose of Synthroid. So we actually purposely make patients hyperthyroid slightly, okay? Uh, imaging, so neck ultrasound, I think I've said this a million times, um, the importance of a high quality neck ultrasound, especially post-operatively. So 
post-operative neck ultrasounds are actually quite tr tricky. They, they take a bit of expertise and volume to get good at, um, because as you can imagine, it, it's not uh, a native neck, right? It's not what the neck used to look like. Now there's all this extra scar tissue and all this funny stuff, and you can get people over calling things or under calling things. So you do need a bit of expertise to, to have a good post-operative high quality neck ultrasound. Um, other imaging is done as needed, but it's not routine for everyone, especially in the low um, and intermediate risk category. We wouldn't routinely be doing things like CT scans, PET scans, bone scans. And that's because every time I scan you, I give you radiation exposure. And if there's no benefit to doing that, then I have a risk without a benefit. And so hence, we don't do that. And then clinical visits. Um, so I feel everyone's neck at every visit um, and ensure that there's no palpable lymph nodes. And every once in a while, I actually do still find something which I'm like, oh, good. Like I'm doing this for a reason and not just because we traditionally did this and now imaging is going to find everything. Every once in a while, there actually wasn't, you know, someone didn't detect something, especially in the back of the neck in the level five area. Um, so I'll continue to do it. Okay. It makes me feel good and it makes patients feel good and I'm going to keep doing it. And yeah. So, um, to, to uh, kind of operationalize what I mean by high quality neck ultrasound. So ultrasounds are operator dependent, and this is the best way that anyone has ever explained what operator dependent means to me. So the image on the left um, of this forklift, I, I think this is clear that this is operator dependent. So if I was to drive this, I would probably just damage a building um, and it wouldn't be good. And then on the right, an elevator is not operator dependent. Everyone will press the button and the, and the elevator will move regardless of my skill level of pressing the button, okay? So that's sort of what, what I mean by um, operator dependent neck ultrasounds versus CT scans, for example, which are not operator dependent. They're like elevators, okay? Um, and so you can have them at sort of any center and that sort of thing. And I, I come from Alberta, Canada, um, where there's a lot of care delivered in rural areas and smaller centers. And so if they're getting a CT scan, stay at home, save yourself the drive to the big city and get your, your, your CT scan there. But if there's someone who's got a tricky neck and I'm really suspicious about a lymph node, I usually have them come to Calgary to a major center to get their ultrasound up. Okay. So we talked about um, the blood tests and imaging. Next is based on the results of the blood tests and imaging, we communicate the status of your cancer um, using specific terminology that the guidelines call response to therapy. Okay. So what is response to therapy? This is just the way that doctors communicate about what's the status of your cancer. Is it gone? Has it come back? And has it spread anywhere? And so excellent response um, intuitively feels good. Okay. It's excellent. You're responding excellently. And this means that your thyroglobulin is negative and your imaging is also negative. We can't find cancer anywhere. Biochemical incomplete response means your tumor marker is up, it's greater than one, but we can't find anything yet. So what I'm presuming it is, is microscopic disease. There's little microscopic disease somewhere, but it's not big enough that it's showing up anywhere on imaging. Structural incomplete response means I've found something on the imaging, either an ultrasound, a cat scan, a PET scan, a bone scan, any of the scans. And so it could be a lymph node or it could be something that's spread elsewhere. And then indeterminate response is like our kind of trash can bin, um, category where I just don't know what it is. There's a little nubbin of tissue in your neck and I don't know yet if it's thyroid cancer or if it's just scar tissue, then it's an indeterminate response. I can't determine what it is. Okay. So last thing is your response to therapy is used to refine your initial risk of recurrence. So you'll remember this case that I had presented. Um, sorry. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. I over animate my talks, I'm told. Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna take it one at a time. Okay, so uh, scenario one, this is this woman that I had presented who's a 28 year old woman, stage one and intermediate risk of recurrence. In scenario one, at six months, her tumor marker is negative. At 12 months, her tumor marker is negative. Her neck ultrasound's negative. So everything's looking good, right? Scenario two, at six months, her tumor marker has started rising, but her ultrasound's still normal. And at 12 months, same thing, her tumor marker rose and her ultrasound still normal. And then in scenario three, at six months, her tumor marker is quite a lot higher, 1.5, and her ultrasound shows an abnormal lymph node in the neck. And biopsy of that lymph node is positive for papillary thyroid cancer. So all of these patients started out as intermediate risks, but each patient had their own response during the monitoring window. So what 
Now, how do we communicate that? So this first patient falls under the excellent response category. The second patient, it's just a tumor marker that's up and I can't find anything on imaging. So that's biochemical incomplete. And the third scenario, um, I found something on the the ultrasound biopsied it, and it is papillary thyroid cancer that's come back. And so that's a structural incomplete response. So that's the way that we communicate disease status, okay? Um, why that's important is because then once we implemented this type of classification, people started doing studies on it. And then we learned a lot more information about how your response to therapy modifies your risks and your staging over time, okay? So this is the proportion of patients in each response to therapy category based on their initial risk. So there's a lot of info. I'll just walk you through the two yellow boxes or orange boxes. So um, in the first row, this is an excellent response patient. So I could their TG was negative, their ultrasound's negative. And so in a low risk patient, um, most patients will fall into excellent response, okay? Versus in a high risk patient, so if you started out high risk, only 15% of patients are gonna get an excellent response, okay? Um, versus intermediate, where 60% of patients get an excellent response. Conversely, if you start with low risk of recurrence, there's only a two to 6% chance that you will actually get structural disease ever. Um, intermediate risk, there's a 20 to 30% chance. And then high risk, you can see it's 60 to 75%. And some estimates are 80% and over. It depends on how long you follow those patients. Okay, so what's the take home? Because that was a whole bunch of information. The take home is this. When you combine your initial ATA risk and your response to therapy, you get a dynamic risk over time. So for example, if you are low risk of recurrence and you had an excellent response, your tumor marker is fine, your ultrasounds are fine. Initially, we told you that you had a three to 5% chance the cancer was gonna come back, but over time, it actually falls to around 1%. And most of the estimates in the study is at five years post op, it falls to 1% or less. And so it's at five years that I basically say, the chances that you're cured here are very high. Okay. Where the risk actually gets modified a lot more though, is in the intermediate risk patients. So those patients, I told them up front, you've got a 15 to 40% chance the cancer is going to come back, but now they're in excellent response category. So their tumor marker is negative. Their ultrasound's negative for that person. Even their risk of recurrence at five years is 1%. So you can see that their risk fell dramatically from 15 to 40% down to the one to 4% range because their tumor marker and their ultrasound are negative. So that's how we integrate the response to therapy into your ongoing, what's called dynamic risk estimate. Okay. So, um, why do we risk stratify people? And that's because we don't want to treat every single person the same. Thyroid cancer is a big spectrum of disease. And I, sh I don't think it's appropriate to treat patients who have 100% survival and a 1% chance of recurrence the same as someone who has way more aggressive disease. We should be treating those things differently. So that's called risk stratified approach to monitoring. Okay. So risk stratified approach basically means I figured out if you're low, intermediate or high, and then that um, determined your initial extent of surgery, radioactive iodine dosing, what your TSH suppression target is, and then your monitoring strategy. So what type of tests do you need? Is it CAT, CAT scans, PET scans, or just ultrasounds? And how frequently do I need to see that patient? Okay. And then obviously we modify that based on the response to therapy, that, that, bu those buckets I said about excellent response, biochemical or structural incomplete. Okay. So how often should you be doing things? Cause after all, this is a talk about monitoring. Okay. So a risk stratified approach to um, the initial first year post-op, this is what most centers will do. Please. This is not the same at every center. And there's lots of practical and real world reasons for that. And so it doesn't mean they're doing the wrong thing. It's just what the ATA guidelines have put forward. Okay. And I would say my own clinical practice is very similar to this. So um, if you started out as a low risk of recurrence patient, everyone gets a baseline tumor marker, obviously, because I don't know what to make of something a year from now, if I didn't know what it was now. Right. So everyone gets a baseline. And then at one year, you'll get your post-operative thyroglobulin and neck ultrasound. That's it. So you get 
you see the endocrinologist six weeks post-op and then at a year again with an ultrasound and blood work. If you're intermediate risk, you still get the baseline, but you, usually most centers will see them twice in the first year at six and 12 months with ultrasound and blood work. And then high risk really depends. It's super variable because it depends on why, what made you high risk in the first place. And so it's discretionary. And typically those patients are getting more than just a neck ultrasound. They're typically getting CAT scans or PET scans or MRIs or whatnot um, to, to monitor them, okay? Um, a risk stratified approach to long-term management. So what happens is after I actually have your response, so what your tumor marker and your imaging is doing, I follow you based on your response to therapy category and not what your initial risk was. So, and not I, the, the field of thyroid cancer, okay? Um, so for example, if you're fall into the excellent response to therapy category, then essentially you go to once a year monitoring, even if you had started out as an intermediate risk patient, okay? But if there's something indeterminate or if your tumor marker is up, then I should be following those patients more often and I should be seeing them more often. So I think that that's important as well is um, we should de-escalate monitoring for low risk patients or intermediate risk patients that are doing well, that their tumor marker and everything is reassuring, but we actually need to sometimes escalate monitoring for patients where something is up here, something's brewing, your tumor marker keeps going up, but I can't see anything yet on the neck ultrasound. That's probably not the patient to send away for a year and say, I won't see you for a year. And then all of a sudden, when I see them a year later, there's a big lymph node or something else, you might intensify the, the follow-up for that patient. Okay, so again, practical tips from Dr. G. Um, at each visit, your doctor should go over what your tumor marker is, your thyroglobulin and antibodies. Um, and if done, if you've had imaging tests, then what were the results? If your tumor marker is rising, this could mean your cancer is growing back, but it could also mean a lot of other things, okay? And especially in this era where on Epic, we share the same EMR in Canada and in Boston, um, Patients have access to their tests before I've even seen their results. And then they're like knocking down my door because they're worried that their tumor marker is up, but there's a perfectly good reason for it. So I think it's a very good thing. I, I strongly advocate for having access to your own medical reports and all of that. I think that's excellent. And as someone who my family members have accessed the healthcare system a ton and I've fought to get access to their healthcare records, I think it's great that we have that now. But avoid Dr. Google, okay, contact your doctor and just know that there's lots of different reasons why, for example, your tumor marker could be rising that aren't all because your thyroid cancer is back, okay? Um, similarly, neck ultrasounds are done to look for thyroid cancer in the lymph nodes, uh, basically because these are the, that's the most common place where thyroid cancer grows back. So pretty much you're, you're going to be seeing your neck ultrasounds. Um, so get get a copy of your results and look at those. And then, however, it's really common to see stuff. So a study, I think around 2014, 2015, showed that in low risk cases, remember your chance of finding cancer is less than 5%. Um, there was at least 30% of patients who had thyroid bed lesions on their neck ultrasound, and that is scar tissue. So one is, it's totally okay to have little nubbins of tissue on your neck ultrasound. Those are yours to keep, okay? Um, and the majority of those will not be thyroid cancer. And two is you can see why you need someone who has expertise in interpreting these post-operative neck ultrasounds in order for them to be able to distinguish, is that just normal scar tissue, the thing that I see all the time, or is this actually thyroid cancer growing back, okay? Um, but very common to see some scar tissue or post-operative changes and normal lymph nodes. That's the other thing I have had many times where a patient goes and they've got lymph nodes all over their neck and, it, and then I'm worried. And then I see them and they say, oh, I had COVID. I had terrible infection. I was coughing. I was sneezing. And, and then we just repeat it. And lo and behold, those lymph nodes are gone. And it was literally your body, your immune system doing what it's supposed to do, right? So um, yeah, so that's the, that. And then the most important way to understand the status of your cancer is to communicate with your treatment team and stay informed about your test results. So that's that. The final part about dynamic risk monitoring is TSH suppression. So I'd mentioned that based on your initial risk, um, we pick a TSH target, but even this changes. This depends on whether you had an excellent response or not. And if you did have an excellent response, we back off on that TSH suppression. So it's actually quite normal um, through your post-operative course to have your Synthroid dose changed and lowered specifically if you're doing well, okay? 
a final practical tips, hopefully. I think I'm wrapping up. Um, okay, so when your TSH is depressed, you're at risk of bone loss, osteoporosis, which can make your bones more fragile and likely to break. So you do want your treatment team to reassess your TSH target over time. So I get referrals not infrequently where someone has been on the same dose of Synthroid for 20 years and their TSH is fully suppressed and they're coming to me because their PCP says, do we have to keep suppressing this person whose cancer is, is older than you? You know what I mean? Like that, not, not actually, but um, <laughs> please. Um, but anyway, so, and, and then I'm the first person to actually start to lower their dose, which is very hard because if someone's body has gotten used to a very high dose of Synthroid for a very long time, we take like baby steps and I'll do that over a year just to get someone slightly down on their dose. Cause nobody's going to, you're, you're not going to win any friends. If you say, okay, I'm just cutting your dose down by 20, 30% the patient's going to be like, yeah, like hell you are. Right. So you do have to go really slowly if you've had that scenario happen. Um, and yeah, and so your synthroid dose may need to change in the first five years or even beyond that, if it hasn't changed duration of long-term monitoring. Okay. So this is a somewhat data gray zone, meaning that we don't have super great evidence to guide us here. Um, because essentially studies don't go out that far. It takes a lot of funding and money to keep monitoring the same patients for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And also patients get sick of it. It's like, you know, the study's calling you again and you've been through like 20 years of follow-up and they just don't want to answer those questions. So it's very hard to do. However, um, you know, we, we do have some guidelines and sort of practice standards. Okay. So there's no one size fits all approach in general patients with an excellent response should have lower intensity and frequency of follow-up. Conversely patients who have a high TG or a rising TG or anything suspicious on imaging need to have higher intensity and frequency of monitoring. There's not a lot of data to tell us what to do after five years. So really a lot of common sense applies here. If you're doing fantastic, you probably don't need to be monitored at a tertiary care cancer center for the rest your life. Um, and, but in most places we will continue to monitor that tumor marker, the thyroglobulin blood test. And I'll tell my patients that when I'm discharging them at five years, continue to have this tumor marker done once a year with your annual blood work that you're going to get anyways, um, through your PCP. Um, and the reason why we pick five years is because the majority of recurrences happen in the first five years. So patients, once you've made it to five years, no matter what your initial risk was, if you have no cancer at that point, it's very unlikely to have a late recurrence, but sometimes it occurs. That's why we do the tumor marker. Okay. And then I think, yeah. Okay. Yes, we made it. So discussion and questions. Thank you so much guys. Okay, so it's time to take some questions. Um, <clears throat> we'll start with one from our uh, virtual audience, if that's okay. Um, so what do you do if your thyroglobulin antibodies are also high? Can you still use the thyroglobulin? Yeah, so it depends on how high, and there's not a ton of data on like the exact perfect number, but it's in general, the higher the antibodies, the more interference there is with the thyroglobulin. So for example, if your antibodies are above, I don't know, 100 or 200, for sure, it's interfering too much that I wouldn't at all um, rely on the thyroglobulin. But if your antibodies are just slightly above the reference range, so say at our center, my reference range is something around 30. And if I've got someone whose thyroglobulin antibodies are 35, I'm still paying attention to the TG. I'm still looking at it. I'm not saying, oh, that's completely useless now. The other thing is, is that you can send it, um, send patients uh, for their thyroglobulin to be measured on something called mass spec, mass spectrometry, which is a fancier way to measure the thyroglobulin. It takes more, it, it's more complicated costly. That's why we don't do it at all centers. And, uh, but that will remove the element of interference from thyroglobulin antibodies. So essentially when I really need it, I send the specimen for mass spec at UBC in Canada. That's um, the closest center that's doing it. Um, so that's a, another possibility, but it really just depends, it, you know, how high the TG antibodies are and how much do you really need to know if it's a person who started out low risk, their ultrasounds are beautiful. I, I probably don't need to go out of my way to do mass spec every single time because the chances of recurrence are extremely low. Hi. Hey. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for your talk. That was really informative. Um, I'm just curious, are there questions we can be asking of ultrasound technicians to know that we're getting a thorough ultrasound? Because I feel like I've had somewhere 
they just stay right in the thyroid bed. And then I've had to ask them to go further. Um, so how do we know yeah. and are there questions to ask? Yeah. So I, you said, are there questions to ask? And I would say, no, there's not necessarily questions to ask the ultrasound technician, but to ask for a, basically a neck ultrasound that encompasses the, the lymph node chains in the back, in the front and the back of the neck. So anterior and posterior lymph node chains. I think you can tell, suggest that that should be done um, instead of just focusing on the thyroid bed, but really the, 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 what's the best way to say this? The place in which that quality is going to be determined is in the protocol that that radiology group made for how neck ultrasounds are done. So high quality centers, they're doing it the exact same way, meaning image one is always the same image one, whether it was done in Calgary, Alberta or Boston. Um, and so, and then image two and three, they go in a specific order in the same exact way. And so it's the protocol development and training the techs on that protocol. That is where quality improvement can happen. If you're a patient that's sitting in that chair right now or on that bed right now, I would just say, say, yep, my doctor wants all, all the entire neck scanned, essentially from your mandible to your clavicle. So like from your jaw to your collarbone, right? Um, on the front and then in the back. So, and I think that's probably what you have control over. Yeah. So we have um, two questions that are uh, related to suppression. So I'm, I'm going to combine them here from our virtual audience, and then we'll go back to somebody in the room. Um, so if the recurrence risk was intermediate, then after 12 months, the dynamic risk was low. When is suppression of TSH no longer needed? And then there's another question wanting to know what, what TSH, TSH range is optimal, and how do you balance the TSH suppression with quality of life? Yeah. Okay, so I'll take the first question first, which is when do you back off on TSH suppression as early as one year, but it will depend on your doctor and what made you intermediate risk to begin with. So there are patients where even though they're doing great at one year, I'll say to them, I, I think I want to keep this TSH suppression going. And if you're still in the excellent response category at two years, then I will back off on it. Okay, certainly you can say for sure that after the first five years, you should if you're doing well and still in the excellent response category, for sure at five years, you should have reduction of your Synthroid and your TSH target should go back into the normal range. Um, but people will do it as early as one year, but somewhere between one and that five-year mark. And then the second question was about quality of life. Yeah, so this is really tricky. This is basically clinic every day and every week, um, you know, for us and, and sitting and chatting with patients and trying to figure out their priorities. Es essentially, the question is, is what do you do? How do you, mod how do you balance quality of life with the complications of TSH suppression and the long-term complications of TSH suppression are bone loss, like I'd mentioned, and also in patients over the age of 65, atrial fibrillation, which is an arrhythmia of the heart. So those are real risks. However, quality of life is also really, really important. And if you told me tomorrow that I would have to do the rest of my life, but with 20, 30% less energy, I would really struggle to do that. Right. So I think that it is a conversation, um, between your endocrinologist and yourself and to figure out where is that safe zone. I do think that there has to be limits and monitoring and that sort of thing. It can't just be, be on a gazillion micrograms of T3. And then if you feel better, that's great because there are true risks to that. And so I think it has to be a conversation and negotiation, and that actually may change over the course of your life and your different um, phases of life. Like, for example, if you're in childbearing age, I'm going to, I'm going to take that as a different thing than, for example, if you're postmenopausal, right, as a woman. So I think that's just an ongoing conversation. There's no one good answer to that question. Okay, we have an in-room question. I'm just wondering how common um, the report for the whole body scan shows um, an intense increased tracer uptake associated with the right maxilla or nasal area. Okay, yeah, there's a lot of false positives on whole body scans, and that area is very commonly lighting up. So um, your nasal passages, your sinuses, um, even skin sometimes gets contaminated, and so that lights up. There's a number of different areas where there will be bright focal uptake on a post-therapy scan that actually isn't fibroid cancer in that area. That's why, again, you need to 
to interpret that and you need the nuclear medicine doctor and the endocrinologist to actually make sense of it um, because those areas will have a tiny bit of radioactive iodine uptake. And so they will, they can light up quite brightly on the scans. And those are typically post, they're, they're typically um, false positives. Sometimes I see the tonsils or other air structures at the back of their throat. And, and when I'm really not sure, I will send that person to ENT and actually have them scope, put a camera at the back and actually take a look. Cause I think that's just diligence, right? But yeah, false positives are very common. And so you do need to interpret those results with, yeah, some, some caution. So a question from our virtual audience, does pregnancy increase your risk of recurrence as an intermediate risk patient? Yeah, not really. So we had two studies from the same group that looked at the risk of um, papillary thyroid cancer recurrence uh, in pregnant women. And so based on their risk stratification before pregnancy, what happened during and then afterwards. And in their long-term follow-up data, essentially they showed it does not really increase your risk of recurrence. So if you're a low or intermediate risk patient, your risk of recurrence doesn't change. What we do know is that HCG, the pregnancy hormone does weakly stimulate thyroid cancer. And so if you have thyroid cancer already in your neck, you can see a little bit of faster growth during the pregnancy than you would if they hadn't gotten pregnant. Okay. But it, it doesn't take someone whose risk was low and make it higher. If someone is, um, supposedly low risk with no invasion, no spread, but the, uh, cancer itself was large four and a half centimeters, what, what bucket would they be in? Yeah, they'd still be in low risk. So if your tumor is greater than four centimeters, then your T stage is T3A. Um, there is uh, some famous but quite old literature now, about 30 years old, that show that tumors greater than four centimeters do have an increased risk of um, nodal metastases, so lymph nodes that are involved, as well as distant metastases, so it's spreading to other areas of the body. Um, but typically, those patients actually will present upfront not as just low risk. So, so what I'm saying is that the risk factor for those things of getting nodal metastases or distant metastases was more than just the fact that their tumor was large. They, their tumor was large and it was invading something or it came with a bunch of lymph nodes right up front or that sort of thing. So in and of itself, it would not upstage you. So I just wanted to let you know that we have 10 minutes left in our session. Do we have another question from inside the room? Come on up. Um, thank you for all this. I was just curious, um, as someone who had a partial therapy because it was low risk, um, and has responded well, but just curious, um, I know that kind of limits, like didn't get the, um, radioactive iodine and you can't really look at the different blood tests as well, because you have thyroid tissue, obviously, but I was curious how, um, that might impact, like how frequently then you're doing other things, ultrasound monitoring. So just curious knowing it's low risk, but does still having that half change anything as far as yeah. monitoring over time? Okay, perfect. So the question is in regards to monitoring in lobectomy patients. Um, I've got a couple of things to say about this. So one is everything to do with monitoring and treatment of lobectomy patients has to do with your confidence that you really are a low risk patient. So what I mean is if you really are a low risk patient, even if you can't use the thyroglobulin, which the literature over the last five to seven years would suggest we can't really, we can't use TG in a patient who still has half a thyroid because because in over half of the patients who recurred, their TG didn't really rise. And in a whole bunch of patients where their TG rose, they weren't having a recurrence. So basically your tumor marker isn't super helpful in a lobectomy patient, in which case what you're left with is imaging, right? And what I would say is there isn't a need to escalate imaging. So to do it more frequently or to do more radiation type imaging with CAT scans and stuff, if truly you are a low risk patient. So if you took out a tumor and it was one centimeter and no vascular invasion and everything, then the true risk of recurrence in that patient is so low 
and their survival is 98 to hundred percent such that you'd be comfortable saying, I'm going to monitor you the same as I would once a year. And it's just so unlikely that I'm going to catch something if I start doing it three times a year and you know, that sort of thing, or two times a year. So, um, I, I think upfront, I certainly do sometimes. And that is for the indication that the patient is asking me to, they're saying, I'm not going to sleep well at night. I'm not comfortable yet going to once a year. And so I, of course, like that's a very reasonable indication. If, if you, if you want to get a neck ultrasound twice in the first year, right? And what I say to patients is over time, you will start to trust this, right? I'm telling you that it's low risk. I'm telling you your survival is hundred percent. And basically like your gout and your, and your diabetes might get you first, right? Like that sort of thing. So, I mean, I joke around, obviously I'm being facetious, but, um, but basically what I say is over time, you'll start to trust what I'm saying. And then we will both feel comfortable and we'll both move forward with that. So I don't escalate care, but I also don't insist on, you have to do it the way the guidelines said, and you have to be a robot, like, of course not. Right. So, but if you're truly low risk, you are truly low risk. So, yeah. So we'll take one from the virtual audience and then back to the room. Um, if you have a, a high risk patient with stable thyroglobulin, it's not changing at all. Um, but they have some suspicious lymph nodes, but the whole body scan came back negative. Would they benefit from a PET CT? So short answer? Yes. Um, the reason why is because if you are falling into the high risk of recurrence category and your whole body scan is negative, all that's telling me is that whatever potential disease you have in your body is not radioactive iodine avid. So thyroid cancer has to be, it can be um, avid to radioactive iodine, meaning it takes up radioactive iodine, but more aggressive thyroid cancer actually doesn't take up radioactive iodine. So if I truly had a patient, they're high risk and something on imaging looks suspicious, then I would not stop at a whole body scan because I would say, well, all that tells me is that whatever this thing is, it's not taking up radioactive iodine, which is what I'm expecting in a high risk patient. Right. Hi, my question was just to dig deep again about the protocol and the understanding of a high quality ultrasound as a patient who um, you know, I have family in the healthcare, but I myself am not in healthcare. So I want to make sure that if, and when someone's not with me, I can tell if it's a high quality or not. So for example, what is your opinion on, I went to a place and they said their protocol is they usually have, you know, I went in for just the left, they did the whole neck scan to make sure. And then they said that a second person was going to come in and evaluate as well. And then they discuss with each other, then speak with the doctor who <laughs> spoke with my PCP and the endocrinologist. I mean, I think because of the many steps, it's okay, but what is your opinion? I mean, in, in general, it's very... it sounds like they're being very diligent, like just on spec, it sounds like they're being very diligent. I think um, there's a couple of things that are just common sense things. This is not stuff that they're going to publish in literature, but for example, generally the length of a report is a proxy for its quality. And so what I mean is when I get a report that has one sentence, no recurrence found, what'd you see? Where'd you scan? What did you do? Right. The more you can actually describe to me what actually was done in the room, um, the more helpful it will be. So in general, as a common sense rule, the, the, the length of the report will actually matter. I think two things do have to be specifically commented upon, which is the appearance of the thyroid bed, the left and right thyroid bed, and the lymph nodes chain. So essentially, where did they scan over your neck and what was happening in the lymph in the thyroid bed, right? So those two specific areas have to be mentioned, and then they have to say, I saw this or I didn't see this. Secondly, if something shows up, that also requires a number of steps to make it a high quality neck ultrasound. So if you see a thyroid bed lesion, it's not just enough to say, I saw it. Where was it? How big was it? Was it dark? Was it light? Which is called echogenicity. Were there calcium deposits in it? Was it cystic? Blah, blah, blah. So basically what I'm saying is you, the more you characterize stuff, um, the more I feel like I was there, that's, that's a high quality neck ultrasound versus something that just says there was nothing in the, in the thyroid. Everything's great. Right. Um, and I think that that's really what we're looking for. A lot of us as endocrinologists who do this for a living, we will look at all this, all the images, the dynamic images that come with the report. So I always open up the neck holder sounds and look at all the pictures myself. Um, but it's not as helpful as being in the room because you will only get the images that someone chose to capture. Right. So, but still it's an added step of quality. So I do do it. Uh, what impacts thyroglobulin rising? 
Yeah. So I talked about that earlier and basically tried to reassure people that if your TG is rising, it doesn't necessarily mean a recurrence. And I didn't say, well, what, do, what could it be? Um, so in lobectomy patients, we often see fluctuations in the thyroglobulin. And that's basically because your thyroid is a dynamic organ and it's not going to make the exact identical amount of TG every single day, no matter what's happening in your body, right? Because that protein is being made by the factory of the thyroid, the thyroid follicular cells. And the factory is going to increase or decreases output on a, not even just on a daily basis, but even throughout the day. So it's normal to see some variations there. Also, if you have a lobectomy, you're going to have the chance of developing a nodule in that lobe or nodular disease. Sometimes it's visible as a discrete nodule at other times. It's not yet visible as a discrete nodule. And it's just, when you look, when it comes out, the pathologist will say there's some nodular disease here. Um, so it could be a nodule on that side. It can also be remnant growing back. That's very common, even in a total thyroidectomy patient. So basically you, when the surgeon takes out your thyroid, they can't take out every last cell. There's always a little bit of thyroid tissue left. And especially if you didn't have radioactive iodine afterwards to ablate the remnant, which most low risk patients won't have because they don't need it. Um, then if your TSH pops up, Remember, it's thyroid stimulating hormone, and it can stimulate that remnant to grow. And now you've got more cells where there was, I'm making these numbers up, but where, where there were 10 cells, now they divided and there's 20 cells and those 20 cells divided and there's whatever million cells and I can't do math. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so basically that remnant could be growing back. Um, so all of those things are possible reasons. And then all, honestly, once in a while, we just get a weird assay thing where the patient's on something, we don't know what, and maybe they're taking a long list supplements and their TG pops up to like 300 and freaks me out and then it goes right back down. So I, another practical common sense thing is if you get a TG, that's very out of keeping with your baseline, just repeat it. Just make sure it's real before you go down the path of, you know, updating your will. So yeah. We're literally down to one minute. Any, any further questions from inside the room? If Great so, questions, come guys. Up. thank you. Okay. And then, um, I just want to Thank you for an absolutely amazing presentation. Um, we did not get to all of the questions that were in here uh, in the chat, um, but I think a lot of the answers were actually covered um, in the presentation. So thank you so much for a wonderful talk.